Buddha nature or Buddha principle refers to several related terms, most notably Tathagatagarbha and Buddhadhatu. Tathagatagarbha means the womb or embryo garbha of the thus gone Tathagata, or containing a Tathagata, while Buddhadhatu literally means Buddha realm or Buddha substrate. Tathagatagarbha has a wide range of sometimes conflicting meanings in Indian and later East Asian and Tibetan Buddhist literature. Debates on what the term means continues to be a major part of Mahayana Buddhist scholastics. For example, the Tibetan scholar Go Lhotsawa outlined four meanings of the term Tathagatagarbha as used by Indian Buddhist scholars generally, one, as an emptiness that is a non-implicative negation, two, the luminous nature of the mind, three, alaya vijnana, store consciousness, four, all bodhisattvas and sentient beings. Topic. Etymology Tathagatagarbha The term Tathagatagarbha may mean embryonic Tathagata, womb of the Tathagata, or containing a Tathagata. Various meanings may all be brought into mind when the term Tathagatagarbha is being used. Topic. Compound The Sanskrit term Tathagatagarbha is a compound of two terms, Tathagata and Garbha. Tathagata means, the one thus gone, referring to the Buddha. It is composed of, Tatha, and, Agata, thus come, or, Tatha, and, Gata, thus gone. The term refers to a Buddha, who has, thus gone, from samsara into nirvana, and, thus come from nirvana into samsara to work for the salvation of all sentient beings. Garbha. Womb. Embryo. Center. Essence. Topic. Asian translations The Chinese translated the term Tathagatagarbha as traditional Chinese, Ru Lai Kang Pinyin, Ru Lai Zhang, or Tathagata's Rulai storehouse. Zhang, according to Brown, storehouse may indicate both that which enfolds or contains something, or that which is itself enfolded, hidden or contained by another. The Tibetan translation is Dbz Hin Gse Gs Pi Snyan Po, which cannot be translated as womb, mngal or l hums, but as embryonic essence kernel, or heart. The term heart was also used by Mongolian translators. Topic Western translations The term Tathagatagarbha is translated and interpreted in various ways by Western translators and scholars. According to Sally King, the term Tathagatagarbha may be understood in two ways, embryonic Tathagata, the incipient Buddha, the cause of the Tathagata, womb of the Tathagata, the fruit of Tathagata. According to King, the Chinese Rulezhong was taken in its meaning as womb or fruit. Wayman and Wayman also point out that the Chinese regularly takes Garbha as womb, but prefer to use the term embryo. According to Brown, following Wayman and Wayman, embryo is the best fitting translation, since it preserves the dynamic, self-transformative nature of the Tathagatagarbha. According to Zimmerman, garbha may also mean the interior or center of something, and its essence or central part. As a tatpurusa it may refer to a person being a womb for or container of the Tathagata. As a bahuvrihi it may refer to a person as having an embryonic tathagata inside. In both cases, this embryonic tathagata still has to be developed. Zimmerman concludes that tathagatagarbha is a bahuvrihi, meaning containing a tathagata, but notes the variety of meanings of garbha, such as containing, born from, embryo, embracing, concealing, womb, calyx, child, member of a clan, core, which may all be brought into mind when the term tathagatagarbha is being used. Topic. Buddha nature. The term, 
Buddha nature. Traditional Chinese, Fuxing Pinyin, Foxing, Japanese, Busho is closely related in meaning to the term Tathagatagarbha, but is not a translation of this term. It refers to what is essential in the human being, the corresponding Sanskrit term is Buddhadhatu. It has two meanings, namely the nature of the Buddha, equivalent to the term Dharmakaya, and the cause of the Buddha. The link between the cause and the result is the nature datu, which is common to both, namely the dharmadhatu. Matsumoto Shiro also points out that Buddha nature translates the Sanskrit term Buddhadhatu, a place to put something, a foundation, a locus. According to Shiro, it does not mean original nature or essence, nor does it mean the possibility of the attainment of Buddhahood. The original nature of the Buddha, or the essence of the Buddha. In the Vajrayana, the term for Buddha nature is Shugatagarbha. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Indian Sutra sources. Topic: <inaudible> 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 Earliest sources. According to Wayman, the idea of the Tathagatagarbha is grounded on sayings by the Buddha that there is something called the luminous mind which is only adventitiously covered over by defilements The luminous mind is mentioned in a passage from the Anguttara Nikaya. Luminous, monks, is the mind. And it is defiled by incoming defilements. The Mahasamgika school coupled this idea of the luminous mind with the idea of the mulavanyana, the substratum consciousness that serves as the basis consciousness. From the idea of the luminous mind emerged the idea that the awakened mind is the pure, vijjati, undefiled mind. In the Tathagatagarbha sutras, it is this pure consciousness that is regarded to be the seed from which Buddhahood grows. When this intrinsically pure consciousness came to be regarded as an element capable of growing into Buddhahood, there was the embryo garba of the Tathagata equals Buddha doctrine. Whether or not this term is employed, Karl Brunholzl writes that the first probable mention of the term is in the Ekatarika Agama, though here it is used in a different way than in later texts. The passage states: if someone devotes himself to the Ekatarikagama, then he has the Tathagatagarbha. Even if his body cannot exhaust defilements in this life, in his next life he will attain supreme wisdom. This Tathagatagarbha idea was the result of an interplay between various strands of Buddhist thought, on the nature of human consciousness and the means of awakening. Gregory comments on this origin of the Tathagatagarbha doctrine, the implication of this doctrine is that enlightenment is the natural and true state of the mind. Topic. Avatamsaka Sutra According to Wayman, the Avatamsaka Sutra 1st, 3rd century CE was the next step in the development of the Buddha nature thought after the concept of the luminous mind. W. Here it is taught that the Buddha's divine knowledge pervades sentient beings, and that its representation in an individual being is the substratum consciousness. The Avatamsaka Sutra does not contain a singular discussion of the concept, but the idea of a universal penetration of sentient beings by the wisdom of the Buddha was complementary to the concept of the Buddha womb. The basic idea of the Avatamsaka Sutra is the unity of the Absolute and the Relative, all in one, one in all. The all melts into a single whole. There are no divisions in the totality of reality. I.T. views the cosmos as holy, as one bright pearl, the universal reality of the Buddha. The universal Buddhahood of all reality is the religious message of the Avatamsaka Sutra. All levels of reality are related and interpenetrated. This is depicted in the image of Indra's net. This unity in totality allows every individual entity of the phenomenal world its uniqueness without attributing an inherent nature to anything. <laughs> Sadharma Pundarika Sutra 
The Lotus Sutra SKT, Sadharma Pundarika Sutra, written between 100 BCE and 200 CE, does not mention Buddha nature, but shares other themes and ideas with the later Tathagatagarbha Sutras like the Tathagatagarbha Sutra and some scholars theorize that it was an influence on these texts. The tenth chapter emphasizes, in accordance with the Bodhisattva ideal of the Mahayana teachings, that everyone can be liberated. All living beings can become a Buddha, not only monks and nuns, but also laypeople, sravakas, bodhisattvas, and non-human creatures. It also details that all living beings can be a teacher of the Dharma. The twelfth chapter of the Lotus Sutra details that the potential to become enlightened is universal among all people, even the historical Devadatta has the potential to become a Buddha. The story of Devadatta is followed by another story about a dragon princess who is both a Naga and a female, whom the Bodhisattva Manyasri proclaims will reach enlightenment immediately, in her present form. Tathagatagarbha Sutras There are several major Indian texts which discuss the idea of Buddha nature and they are often termed the Tathagatagarbha Sutras. According to Brunholzl, "...the earliest Mahayana Sutras that are based on and discuss the notion of Tathagatagarbha as the Buddha potential that is innate in all sentient beings began to appear in written form in the late 2nd and early 3rd century." Their ideas became very influential in East Asian Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. Mahayana sutras which mention this doctrine include the Tathagatagarbha Sutra, Ananatva Apranatva Nirdesa, Sramaladevi Simanada Sutra, Mahayana Mahaparinirvana Sutra, Angulimalaya Sutra and the Lankavatara Sutra. The Tathagatagarbha Sutra 200-250 CE is considered the earliest expression of this the Tathagatagarbha doctrine and the term Tathagatagarbha itself seems to have been coined in this very sutra. It states that one is already or primordially awakened and that all beings already have perfect Buddhahood within themselves but do not recognize it because it is covered over by afflictions. Another one of these texts, the Ganavyuha Sutra, as quoted by Longchunpa, states that the Tathagatagarbha is the ground of all things. The ultimate universal ground also has always been with the Buddha essence Tathagatagarbha, and this essence in terms of the universal ground has been taught by the Tathagata. The fools who do not know it, because of their habits, see even the universal ground as having various happiness and suffering and actions and emotional defilements. Its nature is pure and immaculate, its qualities are as wishing jewels, there are neither changes nor cessations. Whoever realizes it attains liberation. Topic: Sramala Devi Simanada Sutra. The Sramala Devi Simanada Sutra, third century CE, also named the Lion's Roar of Queen Sramala, centers on the teaching of the Tathagatagarbha as ultimate soteriological principle. Regarding the Tathagatagarbha, it states, Lord, the Tathagatagarbha is neither self nor sentient being, nor soul, nor personality. The Tathagatagarbha is not the domain of beings who fall into the belief in a real personality, who adhere to wayward views, whose thoughts are distracted by voidness. Lord, this Tathagatagarbha is the embryo of the illustrious Dharmadhatu, the embryo of the Dharmakaya, the embryo of the supramundane Dharma, the embryo of the intrinsically pure Dharma. In the Sramaladevi Simanada Sutra there are two possible states for the Tathagatagarbha. E. Either covered by defilements, when it is called only embryo of the Tathagata, or free from defilements, when the embryo of the Tathagata is no more the embryo potentiality but the tathagata actuality the sutra itself states it this way this dharmakaya of the tathagata when not free from the store of defilement is referred to as the tathagatagarbha topic <laughs> mahaparinirvana sutra The early Buddha nature concept is expressed in the seminal Tathagatagarbha Sutra named the Nirvana Sutra as, according to Kevin Trainer, as follows. 
Sentient beings are said to possess a sacred nature that is the basis for them becoming Buddhas. This Buddha nature is in fact our true nature. Universal and completely unsullied by whatever psychological and karmic state an individual may be in. The Mahaparinirvana Sutra written 2nd century CE was very influential in the Chinese reception of the Buddhist teachings. The Mahayana Mahaparinirvana Sutra linked the concept of Tathagatagarbha with the Buddhadhatu. Kosho Yamamoto points out that the Nirvana Sutra contains a series of equations, thus, there comes about the equation of, Buddha body. Dharmakaya Eternal body Topic. Eternal Buddha Eternity. Quote. According to Shimoda Masahiro, the authors of the Mahaparinirvana Sutra were leaders and advocates of stupa worship. The term Buddhadhatu originally referred to relics. In the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, it came to be used in place of the concept of Tathagatagarbha. The authors used the teachings of the Tathagatagarbha Sutra to reshape the worship of the physical relics of the Buddha into worship of the inner Buddha as a principle of salvation. Sasaki, in a review of Shimoda, conveys a key premise of Shimoda's work, namely, that the origins of Mahayana Buddhism and the Nirvana Sutra are entwined, the Buddha nature is always present, in all times and in all beings. This does not mean that sentient beings are at present endowed with the qualities of a Buddha, but that they will have those qualities in the future. It is obscured from worldly vision by the screening effect of tenacious negative mental afflictions within each being. Once these negative mental states have been eliminated, however, the Buddha Dhatu is said to shine forth unimpededly and the Buddha sphere Buddha Dhatu, Visaya, can then be consciously entered into, and therewith deathless nirvana attained t he tathagatagarbha is none but thusness or the Buddha nature, and is the originally untainted pure mind which lies overspread by, and exists in, the mind of greed and anger of all beings. This bespeaks a Buddha body that exists in a state of bondage. According to Sally B. King, it does not represent a major innovation, and is rather unsystematic, which made it a fruitful one for later students and commentators, who were obliged to create their own order and bring it to the text. According to King, its most important innovation is the linking of the term Buddhadhatu with Tathagatagarbha. The sutra presents the Buddha nature or Tathagatagarbha as a self. The Mahaparinirvana Sutra refers to a true self. The Mahayana Mahaparinirvana Sutra, especially influential in East Asian Buddhist thought, goes so far as to speak of it as our true self Atman. Its precise metaphysical and ontological status is, however, open to interpretation in the terms of different Mahayana philosophical schools. For the Madhyamikas, it must be empty of its own existence like everything else. For the Yogacarans, following the Lankavatara, it can be identified with store consciousness, as the receptacle of the seeds of awakening. Paul Williams states. It is obvious that the Mahaparinirvana Sutra does not consider it impossible for a Buddhist to affirm an Atman provided it is clear what the correct understanding of this concept is, and indeed the Sutra clearly sees certain advantages in doing so, but it speaks about Buddha nature in so many different ways, that Chinese scholars created a list of types of Buddha nature that could be found in the text. Paul Williams also notes, Nevertheless the sutra as it stands is quite clear that while we can speak of the Tathagatagarbha as self, actually it is not at all a self, and those who have such self-notions cannot perceive the Tathagatagarbha and thus become enlightened see Ruig 1989a, 21-6. Topic. Lankavatara Sutra 
The Lankavatara Sutra compiled 350 to 400 CE synthesized the Tathagatagarbha doctrine and the Alaya Vijnana doctrine. The Lankavatara Sutra assimilates Tathagata Garbha thought to the Yogacara viewpoint, and this assimilation is further developed in the treatise on the awakening of faith in the Mahayana. According to the Lankavatara Sutra Tathagatagarbha is identical to the Alaya Vijnana, known prior to awakening as the storehouse consciousness or eighth consciousness. The Alaya Vijnana is supposed to contain the pure seed, or Tathagatagarbha, from which awakening arises. The Lankavatara Sutra contains Tathagatagarbha thought, but also warns against reification of the idea of Buddha nature, and presents it as an aid to attaining awakening. Is not this Tathagatagarbha taught by the Blessed One the same as the ego substance taught by the philosophers? The ego as taught by the philosophers is an eternal creator, unqualified, omnipresent, and imperishable, the Blessed One replied. It is emptiness, reality limit, nirvana, being unborn, unqualified, and devoid of will effort, the reason why the Tathagatas teach the doctrine pointing to the Tathagata Garbha is to make the ignorant caste aside their fear when they listen to the teaching of egolessness and to have them realize the state of non-discrimination and imagelessness. According to Alex and Hadiko Wayman, the equation of Tathagata Garbha and Alaya Vijnana in the Lankavatara fails. It is plain that when the Lankavatara Sutra identifies the two terms, this scripture necessarily diverges in the meaning of one or both of the terms from the usage of the term Tathagatagarbha in the earlier Sri Mala or of the term Alaya Vijnana in the subsequent Yogacara school. In Indian commentaries The Tathagatagarbha doctrine was also widely discussed by Indian Mahayana scholars in treatises or commentaries, called Sastra, the most influential of which was the Ritnagatravabhaga 5th century CE. <laughs> Ritnagatravabhaga or Uttaratantrasastra The Ritnagatravabhaga, also called Uttaratantrasastra 5th century CE, is an Indian sastra in which synthesized all the major elements and themes of the Tathagatagarbha theory. It gives an overview of authoritative Tathagatagarbha sutras, mentioning the Tathagatagarbha Sutra, the Sramaladevi Simanada Sutra, Mahaparinirvana Sutra, the Angulimulya Sutra, the Ananatva Apranatva Nirdesa and the Mahabhariharika Sutra. It presents the Tathagatagarbha as an ultimate, unconditional reality that is simultaneously the inherent, dynamic process towards its complete manifestation. Mundane and enlightened reality are seen as complementary. Thusness tathata, defiled as the Tathagatagarbha, and thusness undefiled as enlightenment. In the Ritnagatravabhaga, the Tathagatagarbha is seen as having three specific characteristics, one, dharmakaya, two, suchness, and three, disposition, as well as the general characteristic, four, non-conceptuality. According to the Ritnagatravabhaga, all sentient beings have the embryo of the Tathagata. In three senses, the Tathagata's dharmakaya permeates all sentient beings. The Tathagata's tathata is omnipresent, avyadibeda. The Tathagata's species gotra, a synonym for Tathagatagarbha occurs in them. The Ritnagatravabhaga equates enlightenment with the Nirvana realm and the Dharmakaya. It gives a variety of synonyms for Garbha, the most frequently used being Gotra and Dhatu. This text also explains the Tathagatagarbha in terms of luminous mind. The luminous nature of the mind is unchanging, just like space. Topic. Madhyamaka school Indian Madhyamaka philosophers interpreted the theory as a description of emptiness and as a non-implicative negation. Bhavivaka's Tarkajvala states, the expression possessing the Tathagata heart is used because emptiness, signlessness, wishlessness, and so on, exist in the mind streams of all sentient beings. However, it is not something like a permanent and all-pervasive person that is the inner agent. 
for we find passages such as all phenomena have the nature of emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness. What is emptiness, signlessness, and wishlessness as the Tathagata, Khandrakirti's Madhyamakavatarabhasya states, one should know that since the alaya consciousness follows the nature of all entities, it is nothing but emptiness that is taught through the term alaya consciousness, Golatsawa states that this statement is referencing the Tathagatagarbha doctrine. Khandrakirti's Madhyamakavatarabhasya also argues, basing itself on the Lankavatara Sutra, that the statement of the emptiness of sentient beings being a Buddha adorned with all major and minor marks is of expedient meaning. Kamalasilas C. 740-795 Madhyamakaloka associates Tathagatagarbha with luminosity and luminosity with emptiness. This statement all sentient beings possess the Tathagata heart teaches that all are suitable to attain the state of unsurpassable completely perfect awakening since it is held that the term Tathagata expresses that the Dharmadhatu, which is characterized by personal and phenomenal identitylessness, is natural luminosity, uniquely among Madhyamaka texts, some texts attributed to Nagarjuna, mainly poetic works like the Dharmadhatustava, Chittavarastava, and Bodhikatavivarana associate the term Tathagatagarbha with the luminous nature of the mind. <laughs> <laughs> Yogacara scholars According to Brunholzl all early Indian Yogacara masters such as Asanga, Vasubandhu, Sturamati, and Asvabhava, if they refer to the term Tathagatagarbha at all, always explain it as nothing but suchness in the sense of twofold identitylessness. Some later Yogacara scholars spoke of the Tathagatagarbha in more positive terms, such as Jnanasramitra who in his Sakharasati equates it with the appearances of lucidity, Prakasarupa. Likewise, Brunholzl notes that Ratnakarasanti generally describes the Tathagata heart as being equivalent to naturally luminous mind, nondual self-awareness, and the perfect nature which he considers to be an implicative negation and not a non-implicative negation. <laughs> Alaya Vijnana The Yogacara concept of the Alaya Vijnana store consciousness also came to be associated by some scholars with the Tathagatagarbha. This can be seen in sutras like the Lankavatara, the Sramaladevi and in the translations of Paramartha. The concept of the Alaya Vijnana originally meant defiled consciousness, defiled by the workings of the five senses and the mind. It was also seen as the Mula Vijnana, the base consciousness or stream of consciousness from which awareness and perception spring, to account for the notion of Buddha nature in all beings, with the Yogacara belief in the five categories of beings, Yogacara scholars in China such as Su N, C N 632-682 the first patriarch in China, advocated two types of nature, the latent nature found in all beings Li Fu Xing and the Buddha nature in practice. Xing Fu Xing. The latter nature was determined by the innate seeds in the Alaya. Topic. Trikaya doctrine Around 300 CE, the Yogacara school systematized the prevalent ideas on the nature of the Buddha in the Trikaya or Three-Body Doctrine. According to this doctrine, Buddhahood has three aspects. The Nirmanakaya, or transformation body, the earthly manifestation of the Buddha, the Sambhogakaya, or enjoyment body, a subtle body, by which the Buddha appears to bodhisattvas to teach them. The Dharmakaya, or Dharma body, the ultimate nature of the Buddha, and the ultimate nature of reality, they may be described as follows. The first is the knowledge body, Nyanakaya, the inner nature shared by all Buddhas, their Buddhaness. Buddhata. The second aspect of the Dharma body is the self existent body. Svabhavikakaya. This is the ultimate nature of reality, thusness, emptiness, the non-nature which is the very nature of dharmas, their dharma-ness dharmata. It is the Tathagata Garbha and Bodhicitta hidden within beings, and the transformed storehouse consciousness. In Chinese Buddhism 
The Tathagatagarbha idea was extremely influential in the development of East Asian Buddhism. When Buddhism was introduced to China, in the 1st century CE, Buddhism was understood through comparisons of its teachings to Chinese terms and ways of thinking. Chinese Buddhist thinkers like Ji Mindu, Jidan, and Wiyuan d. 433 interpreted Buddhist concepts in terms of the Chinese neo-Taoist philosophy called dark learning Xuanzu. This tendency was only later countered by the work of Chinese Madhyamaka scholar translators like Kumarajiva. The Buddha nature idea was introduced into China with the translation of the Mahapuranirvana Sutra in the early 5th century and this text became the central source of Buddha nature doctrine in Chinese Buddhism. Based on their understanding of the Mahayana Mahaparinirvana Sutra some Chinese Buddhists supposed that the teaching of the Buddha nature was, as stated by that sutra, the final Buddhist teaching, and that there is an essential truth above sunyata and the two truths. This idea was interpreted as being similar to the ideas of Tao and principle Li in Chinese philosophy. The awakening of faith The awakening of faith was very influential in the development of Chinese Buddhism said to have been translated by Paramartha 499-569. While the text is traditionally attributed to Asvaosa, no Sanskrit version of the text is extant. The earliest known versions are written in Chinese, and contemporary scholars believe that the text is a Chinese composition. The Awakening of Faith in the Mahayana offers a synthesis of Chinese Buddhist thinking. It sees the Buddha nature doctrine as a cosmological theory, in contrast to the Indo Tibetan tradition, where the soteriological aspect is emphasized. It described the one mind, which includes in itself all states of being of the phenomenal and transcendental world. It tried to harmonize the ideas of the Tathagatagarbha and Alaya Vijnana. In the words of the Awakening of Faith, which summarizes the essentials of Mahayana, self and world, mind and suchness, are integrally one. Everything is a carrier of that a priori enlightenment, all incipient enlightenment is predicated on it. The mystery of existence is, then, not, how may we overcome alienation? The challenge is, rather, why do we think we are lost in the first place? In the awakening of faith the one mind has two aspects, namely tathata, suchness, the things as they are, and samsara, the cycle of birth and death. This text was in line with an essay by Emperor Wu of the Liang dynasty reign 502 CE, in which he postulated a pure essence, the enlightened mind, trapped in darkness, which is ignorance. By this ignorance the pure mind is trapped in samsara. This resembles the Tathagatagarbha and the idea of the defilement of the luminous mind. In a commentary on this essay Shen Yu stated that insight into this true essence is awakened by stopping the thoughts, a point of view which is also being found in the Platform Sutra of Wainung. The joining together of these different ideas supported the notion of the Ekayana, the one vehicle, absolute oneness, all-pervading Buddha wisdom and original enlightenment as a holistic whole. This synthesis was a reflection of the unity which was attained in China with the United Song dynasty. In Chinese Yogacara and Madhyamaka By the 6th century CE Buddha nature had been well established in Chinese Buddhism and a wide variety of theories developed to explain it. One influential figure who wrote about Buddha nature was Qing Ying Wei Yuan 523-592 CE, a Chinese Yogacaran who argued for a kind of idealism which held that all dharmas without exception originate and are formed from the true mind, and other than the true mind, there exists absolutely nothing which can give rise to false thoughts. Qing Ying Wei Yuan equated this true mind with the Alaya Vijnana, the Tathagatagarbha and Buddha nature foxing, and held that it was an essence, a true consciousness and a metaphysical principle that ensured that all sentient beings will reach enlightenment. According to Ming Wood Lu, 
Wei Yuan's interpretation of the Buddha nature doctrine represents the culmination of a long process of transformation of the Buddha nature from a basically practical to an ontological concept. The Chinese Yogacara school was also split on the relationship between the Tathagatagarbha and Alayavijnana. F. A. Shang, 495 to 580, representing the Southern Yogacara, asserted that they were separate, that the Alaya was illusory and impure, while Buddha nature was the ultimate source of all phenomenal reality. In the Northern School, meanwhile, it was held that the Alaya and Buddha nature were the same pure support for all phenomena. In the 6th and 7th centuries, the Yogacara theory became associated with a substantialist non-dual metaphysics which saw Buddha nature as an eternalistic ground. This idea was promoted by figures like Fazang and Ratnamati. In contrast with the Chinese Yogacara view, the Chinese Madhyamaka scholar Jizang (549–623 CE) sought to remove all ontological connotations of the term as a metaphysical reality and saw Buddha nature as being synonymous with terms like Tathata, Dharmadhatu, Ekayana, Wisdom, Ultimate Reality. Quote, quote, middle way and also the wisdom that contemplates dependent origination. In formulating his view, Jizang was influenced by the earlier Chinese Madhyamaka thinker Sengchao 384-414 CE who was a key figure in outlining an understanding of emptiness which was based on the Indian sources and not on Taoist concepts which previous Chinese Buddhists had used. Jizang used the compound middle way Buddha nature to refer to his view. Jizang was also one of the first Chinese philosophers to famously argue that plants and insentient objects have Buddha nature, which he also termed true reality and universal principle Dao. .In the 20th century, the influential Chinese master Yin Shun drew on Chinese Madhyamaka to argue against any Yogacara-influenced view that Buddha nature was an underlying permanent ground of reality and instead supported the view that Buddha nature teachings are just an expedient means. Yin Shun, drawing on his study of Indian Madhyamaka promoted the emptiness of all things as the ultimate Buddhist truth, and argued that the Buddha nature teaching was a provisional teaching taught in order to ease the fear of some Buddhists regarding emptiness as well as to attract those people who have an affinity to the idea of a self or Brahman. Later after taking up the Buddhist path, they would be introduced to the truth of emptiness. In Tiantai In the Tiantai school, the primary figure is the scholar Ziyi. According to Paul L. Swanson, none of Ziyi's works discuss Buddha nature explicitly at length however. Yet it is still an important concept in his philosophy, which is seen as synonymous with the Ekayana principle outlined in the Lotus Sutra. Swanson argues that for Ziyi, Buddha nature is, an active threefold process which involves the way reality is, the wisdom to see reality as it is, and the practice required to attain this wisdom. Buddha nature is threefold, the three aspects of reality, wisdom, and practice are interdependent one aspect does not make any sense without the others, Buddha nature for Ziyi therefore has three aspects which he bases on passages from the Lotus Sutra and the Nirvana Sutra, the direct cause of attaining Buddhahood, the innate potential in all sentient beings to become Buddhas, which is the aspect of true nature, the way things are. The complete cause of attaining Buddhahood, which is the aspect of wisdom that illuminates the true nature and the goal of practice. The conditional causes of attaining Buddhahood, which is the aspect of the practices and activities that lead to Buddhahood. The later Tiantai scholar Zhanren would expand the Tiantai view of Buddha nature, which he saw as synonymous with suchness, to argue for the idea that insentient rocks and plants also have Buddha nature. Topic. In Chan Buddhism In Chan Buddhism, Buddha nature tends to be seen as the non-substantial essential nature of all beings. But the Zen tradition also emphasizes that Buddha nature is sunyata, the absence of an independent and substantial self. 
Chan masters from Wainung in 7th century China to Hakuan Ikaku in 18th century Japan to Xu Yun in 20th century China, have all taught that the process of awakening begins with the light of the mind turning around within the eighth consciousness, so that the Alayavijnana, also known as the Tathagatagarbha, is transformed into the bright mirror wisdom. The Lankavatara Sutra presents the Chan, Zen Buddhist view of the Tathagatagarbha. The Buddha said, Now, Mahamati, what is perfect knowledge? It is realized when one casts aside the discriminating notions of form, name, reality, and character, it is the inner realization by noble wisdom. This perfect knowledge, Mahamati, is the essence of the Tathagatagarbha. When this act of transformation is complete, the other seven consciousnesses are also transformed. The seventh consciousness of delusive discrimination becomes transformed into the equality wisdom. The sixth consciousness of thinking sense becomes transformed into the profound observing wisdom. And the first to fifth consciousnesses of the five sensory senses become transformed into the all performing wisdom. The Chan master Mazu Daoyi developed a radical interpretation of Buddha nature, famously stating that it was nothing less than ordinary mind and that all beings were already enlightened from the start. The influential Chan patriarch Gaifeng Zongmai interpreted Buddha nature as empty tranquil awareness, which he took from the Jose school of Chan. Following the Sramala Sutra, he interpreted the theory of emptiness as presented in the Prajnaparamita Sutras as provisional and saw Buddha nature as the definitive teaching of Buddhism. According to Heng Ching Shi, the teaching of the universal Buddha nature does not intend to assert the existence of substantial, entity like self endowed with excellent features of a Buddha. Rather, Buddha nature simply represents the potentiality to be realized in the future. Sing Yun, 48th patriarch of the Linji school, equates the Buddha nature with the Dharmakaya in line with pronouncements in key Tathagatagarbha sutras. He defines these two as the inherent nature that exists in all beings. In Mahayana Buddhism, enlightenment is a process of uncovering this inherent nature, the Buddha nature is identical with transcendental reality. The unity of the Buddha with everything that exists. Topic: Korean Buddhism. In the Korean Vajrasamadhi Sutra, 685 CE, the Tathagatagarbha is presented as being possessed of two elements: one essential, immutable, changeless, and still; the other active and salvational. This. Dharma of the One Mind, which is the original Tathagatagarbha, is said to be calm and motionless. The Varasamadhi's analysis of Tathagatagarbha also recalls a distinction the awakening of faith makes between the calm, unchanging essence of the mind and its active, adaptable function. The Tathagatagarbha is equated with the original edge of reality. Buddhakoti that is beyond all distinctions, the equivalent of original enlightenment, or the essence. But Tathagatagarbha is also the active functioning of that original enlightenment, the inspirational power of that fundamental faculty. The Tathagatagarbha is thus both the original edge of reality that is beyond cultivation. Equals essence as well as the specific types of wisdom and mystical talents that are the byproducts of enlightenment equals function equals topic Japanese Buddhism equals topic Nichiren Buddhism Nichiren (1222–1282) was a Buddhist monk who taught devotion to the Lotus Sutra as the exclusive means to attain enlightenment, and the chanting of Namu Myoho Renge Kyo as the essential practice of the teaching. Nichiren Buddhism includes various schools with diverging interpretations of Nichiren's teachings. Nichiren Buddhism views the Buddha nature as the inner potential for attaining Buddhahood, common to all people. Based on the Lotus Sutra, Nichiren maintained that 
all living being possess the Buddha nature, being the inherent potential to attain Buddhahood. The Buddha nature refers to the potential for attaining Buddhahood, a state of awakening filled with compassion and wisdom. The emphasis in Nichiren Buddhism is on revealing the Buddha nature or attaining Buddhahood in this lifetime through chanting the name of the Dharma of the Lotus Sutra. T. The Buddha nature within us is summoned forth and manifested by our chanting of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. The potential for Buddhahood exists in the whole spectrum of the ten worlds of life, and this means that all people, including evil doers, have Buddha nature, which remains as a dormant possibility or a theoretical potential in the field of emptiness or non-substantiality until it is materialized in reality through Buddhist practice. In his letter, Opening the Eyes of Wooden and Painted Images, Nichiren explains that insentient matter such as trees, mandalas, images, statues also possess the Buddha nature, because they serve as objects of worship. This view regards the Buddha nature as the original nature of all manifestations of life, sentient and insentient, through their interconnectedness. This concept of the enlightenment of plants in turn derives from the doctrine of three thousand realms in a single moment of life, which teaches that all life insentient and sentient possesses the buddha nature topic <inaudible> zen buddhism the founder of the soto school of zen buddhism dogen zenji held that buddha nature basho fu xing was simply the true nature of reality and being this true nature was just impermanence becoming and vast emptiness because he saw the whole universe as an expression of Buddha nature, he held that even grass and trees are Buddha nature. Therefore, the very impermanency of grass and tree, thicket and forest is the Buddha nature. The very impermanency of men and things, body and mind, is the Buddha nature. Nature and lands, mountains and rivers, are impermanent because they are the Buddha nature. Supreme and complete enlightenment, because it is impermanent, is the Buddha nature. The founder of Sanbo Kyodan lineage of Zen Buddhism, Yasutani Hakuun Roshi, also defined Buddha nature in terms of the emptiness and impermanence of all dharmas. Everything by its very nature is subject to the process of infinite transformation, this is its Buddha or Dharma nature. What is the substance of this Buddha or Dharma nature? In Buddhism it is called Ku shunyata. Now, Ku is not mere emptiness. It is that which is living, dynamic, devoid of mass, unfixed, beyond individuality or personality the matrix of all phenomena. A famous reference to Buddha nature in the Zen tradition is the Mu Koan. A monk asked Zhaozhou Kongshen, a Chinese Zen master known as Jashu in Japanese, Has a dog Buddha nature or not? Zhaozhou answered, It does not. Wu Chinese, Mu in Japanese. Topic. Shin Buddhism The founder of the Jodo Shinshu of Pure Land Buddhism, Shinrin, equated Buddha nature with Shinjin. Topic. Tibetan Buddhism In Tibetan Buddhist scholastics, there are two main camps of interpreting Buddha nature. There are those who argue that Tathagatagarbha is just emptiness described either as dharmadhatu, the nature of phenomena, or a nonimplicative negation and there are those who see it as the union of the mind's emptiness and luminosity which includes the Buddha qualities. The Gelug school of Tibetan Buddhism favors what is called the Rangtong interpretation of Prasangika Madhyamaka philosophy. They thus interpret Buddha nature as an expedient term for the emptiness of inherent existence. Other schools, especially the Jonang, and Kagyu have tended to accept the Shentong, other empty, Madhyamaka philosophy, which discerns an absolute which is empty of adventitious defilements which are intrinsically other than it, but is not empty of its own inherent existence. These interpretations of the Tathagatagarbha teachings has been a matter of intensive debates in Tibet. Topic. Gelug 
an early Tibetan translator, Nak Lotsawa argues in his commentary to the Uttaratantra that Buddha nature is a non-implicative negation, which is to say that it is emptiness, as a total negation of inherent existence svabhava, that does not imply that anything is left unnegated in terms of its svabhava. Another early figure, Chaba Choki Senj also argued that Buddha nature was a non-implicative negation. The Kadampa tradition generally followed Nak Lotsawa by holding that Buddha nature was a non-implicative negation. The Gelug school, which sees itself as a continuation of the Kadampas, also hold this view, while also holding, as Chaba did, that Buddha nature teachings are of expedient meaning. Kedrub J. Jaleg Balsong (1385–1438), one of the main disciples of Tsongkhapa, defined the Tathagatagarbha thus: "It is the emptiness of minds being empty of being really established that is called the naturally pure true nature of the mind. The naturally pure true nature of the mind in its phase of not being free from adventitious stains is called Sugata heart or naturally abiding disposition." Brunholzl states that the view of Galtsab Dharma Rinchen (1364–1432) is that the Tathagata heart is the state of a being in whom mind's emptiness is obscured, while Buddhas, by definition, do not possess this Tathagata heart. The 14th Dalai Lama sees the Buddha nature as the original clear light of mind but points out that it ultimately does not exist independently, because, like all other phenomena, it is of the nature of emptiness. Once one pronounces the words, emptiness, and absolute, one has the impression of speaking of the same thing, in fact of the absolute. If emptiness must be explained through the use of just one of these two terms, there will be confusion. I must say this, otherwise you might think that the innate original clear light as absolute truth really exists. Sakya Sakya Pandita sees the Buddha nature as the Dharmadhatu free from all reference points, and states that the teaching that Buddha nature exists in all beings is of expedient meaning and that its basis is emptiness, citing Khandrakirti's Madhyamakavatarabhasya. The Sakya scholar Rongtan, meanwhile, argued that Buddha nature is suchness, with stains, or emptiness of the mind with stains. Sakya scholar Bhutan Rinchen Drub, 1290-1364, like the Gelugpas, held that the Buddha nature teachings were of expedient meaning and that, that the naturally abiding disposition is nothing but emptiness. However, unlike them, his view was that the basis for these teachings is the Alaya Vijnana and also that Buddha nature is the Dharmakaya of a Buddha, but never exists in the great mass of sentient beings." According to Brunholzl, in the works of the influential Sakya scholar Gorampa Sanam Senj (1429–1489), Buddha nature is, "...nondal unity of mind's lucidity and emptiness or awareness and emptiness free from all reference points. It is not mere emptiness because sheer emptiness cannot be the basis of both samsara and nirvana. However, it is not mere lucidity either because this lucidity is a conditioned entity and the Tathagata heart is unconditioned. Sakya Chokden meanwhile argues that the ultimate Buddha nature is mind's natural luminosity free from all extremes of reference points, which is the sphere of personally experienced wisdom and an implicative negation. Joning. The Jonang school, whose foremost historical figure was the Tibetan scholar monk Dalpopa Shirab Galtsin (1292–1361), sees the Buddha nature as the very ground of the Buddha himself, as the permanent indwelling of the Buddha in the basal state. According to Brunholzl, Dalpopa, basing himself on certain Tathagatagarbha sutras, argued that the Buddha nature is ultimately really established, everlasting, eternal, permanent, immutable, thursig, and being beyond dependent origination. This is the foundation of what is called the Shentong view. 
Moreover, the Buddhist Tantric scripture entitled Chanting the Names of Manyasri, Manyasri Nama Sangiti, repeatedly exalts, as portrayed by Dalpopa, not the non-self but the self, and applies the following terms to this ultimate reality, the Buddha self, the beginningless self, the solid self, the diamond self. These terms are applied in a manner which reflects the cataphatic approach to Buddhism, typical of much of Dolpapa's writings. Dr. Cyrus Stearns writes that Dolpapa's attitude to the third turning of the wheel doctrines, i.e., the Buddha nature teachings, is that they are the final definitive statements on the nature of ultimate reality, the primordial ground or substratum beyond the chain of dependent origination, and which is only empty of other, relative phenomena. Topic. Nyingma In the Nyingma school doctrines on Buddha nature are generally marked by the tendency to align the idea with Dzogchen views as well as with Prasangika Madhyamaka, beginning with the work of Rongzam and continuing into the work of Longchunpa and Mipham Mipham Rinpoche, the most authoritative figure in modern Nyingma, adopted a view of Buddha nature as the unity of appearance and emptiness, relating it to the descriptions of the ground in Dzogchen as outlined by Longchunpa. This ground is said to be primordially pure and spontaneously present Ihan Grub, Germano writes that Dzogchen represents the most sophisticated interpretation of the so-called Buddha nature. Tradition within the context of Indo Tibetan thought. The 19th, 20th century Nyingma scholar, Shechen Galtsap Gyurm Pema Namgal, sees the Buddha nature as ultimate truth, nirvana, which is constituted of profundity, primordial peace, and radiance. Buddha nature is immaculate. It is profound, serene, unfabricated suchness, an uncompounded expanse of luminosity, non-arising, unceasing, primordial peace, spontaneously present nirvana. Tulku or Jian Rinpoche sees an identity between the Buddha nature, Dharmadhatu essence of all phenomena and the noumenon and the three Vajras, saying, Dharmadhatu is adorned with Dharmakaya, which is endowed with Dharmadhatu wisdom. This is a brief but very profound statement, because Dharmadhatu also refers to Sugata Garbha or Buddha nature. Buddha nature is all-encompassing. This Buddha nature is present just as the shining sun is present in the sky. It is indivisible from the three Vajras i.e. the Buddha's body, speech and mind of the awakened state, which do not perish or change. The Nyingma meditation masters, Kenshin Paldin Shirab and Kenpo Sawang Dongyul, emphasize that the essential nature of the mind the Buddha nature, is not a blankness, but is characterized by wonderful qualities and a non-conceptual perfection that is already present and complete, it's just obscured and we fail to recognize it. Speaking in the context of Nyingma, Dzogchen Ponlop expresses the view that there exists within Vajrayana Buddhism the doctrine that we are already Buddha. In the Vajrayana, we are Buddha right now, in this very moment and that it is legitimate to have Vajra pride in our Buddha mind and the already present qualities of enlightenment with which it is replete. Vajra pride refers to our pride and confidence in the absolute nature of our mind as Buddha, primordially, originally pure, awake and full of the qualities of enlightenment. Topic. Kagyu. According to Brunholzl, virtually all Kagyu masters hold the teaching on Buddha nature to be of definitive meaning and deny that the Tathagata heart is just sheer emptiness or a nonimplicative negation. Though the Kagyu approach has certain similarities with Dolpapa's view, it is generally less absolute than the latter's and shows several significant differences, such as not claiming that the Buddha qualities exist in their full-blown form even in confused sentient beings and not making such an absolute distinction between the two realities as Dolpapa does the exception as Jamgon Kongtrul Lodro Te, who largely follows Taranatha and Dolpapa but at times blends their positions with the third Karmapa's view, in Kagyu the view of the third karmapa is generally seen as the most authoritative. This is the view that Buddha nature is mind's luminous ultimate nature or nandal wisdom, which is the basis of everything in samsara and nirvana. 
Thrangu Rinpoche sees the Buddha nature as the indivisible oneness of wisdom and emptiness. The union of wisdom and emptiness is the essence of Buddhahood or what is called Buddha nature SKT. Tathagata Garbha because it contains the very seed, the potential of Buddhahood. It resides in each and every being and because of this essential nature, this heart nature, there is the possibility of reaching Buddhahood. Topic. The Rimei Movement The Rimei Movement is an ecumenical movement in Tibet which started as an attempt to reconcile the various Tibetan schools in the 19th century. In contrast to the Gelugpa, which adheres to the Rang Stong, self-empty, or Prasangika point of view, the Rimei Movement supports Shen Tong, Ji Zan Tong, other empty, an essential nature which is pure radiant non-dual consciousness. Jamgon Kongtrul says about the two systems, Madhyamika philosophies have no differences in realizing as shunyata, all phenomena that we experience on a relative level. They have no differences also, in reaching the meditative state where all extremes ideas, completely dissolve. Their difference lies in the words they use to describe the dharmata. Shentong describes the Dharmata, the mind of Buddha, as ultimately real, while Rangtong philosophers fear that if it is described that way, people might understand it as the concept of soul or atma. The Shentong philosopher believes that there is a more serious possibility of misunderstanding in describing the enlightened state as unreal and void. Kongtrul finds the Rangtong way of presentation the best to dissolve concepts and the Shentong way the best to describe the experience. Topic. Modern scholarship Modern scholarship points to the various possible interpretations of Buddha nature as either an essential self, as sunyata, or as the inherent possibility of awakening. Topic. Essential self Shenpen Hukam, Oxford Buddhist scholar and Tibetan Lama of the Shentong tradition writes of the Buddha nature or true self as something real and permanent, and already present within the being as uncompounded enlightenment. She calls it the Buddha within, and comments, in scriptural terms, there can be no real objection to referring to Buddha, Buddhajnana, Buddha awareness, Buddha knowledge, Nirvana and so forth as the true self, unless the concept of Buddha and so forth being propounded can be shown to be impermanent, suffering, compounded, or imperfect in some way. In Shentong terms, the non-self is about what is not the case, and the self of the third Dharma chakra, i.e. the Buddha nature doctrine, is about what truly is. Buddhist scholar and chronicler, Merv Fowler, writes that the Buddha nature really is present as an essence within each being. Fowler comments, The teaching that Buddha nature is the hidden essence within all sentient beings is the main message of the Tathagatagarbha literature, the earliest of which is the Tathagatagarbha Sutra. This short sutra says that all living beings are in essence identical to the Buddha regardless of their defilements or their continuing transmigration from life to life. As in the earlier traditions, there is present the idea that enlightenment, or nirvana, is not something which has to be achieved, it is something which is already there. In a way, it means that everyone is really a Buddha now. Topic. Sunyata According to Heng Ching Shi, the Tathagatagarbha, Buddha nature does not represent a substantial self Atman. Rather, it is a positive language expression of emptiness sunyata, which emphasizes the potentiality to realize Buddhahood through Buddhist practices. The intention of the teaching of Tathagatagarbha, Buddha nature is soteriological rather than theoretical. Paul Williams puts forward the Madhyamaka interpretation of the Buddha nature as emptiness in the following terms. If one is a Madhyamika then that which enables sentient beings to become Buddhas must be the very factor that enables the minds of sentient beings to change into the minds of Buddhas. That which enables things to change is their simple absence of inherent existence, their emptiness. 
Thus the Tathagatagarbha becomes emptiness itself, but specifically emptiness when applied to the mental continuum. Topic. Critical Buddhist interpretation Several contemporary Japanese Buddhist scholars, headed under the label Critical Buddhism Hahan Bukkyo, Pai, Fo Jiao have been critical of Buddha nature thought. According to Matsumoto Shiro and Hakamaya Noriaki of Komazawa University, essentialist conceptions of Buddha nature are at odds with the fundamental Buddhist doctrine of dependent origination and non-self the Buddha nature doctrines which they label as Dhatuvada substantialism, sometimes rendered locus theory or topicalism and generative monism is not Buddhism at all. As defined by Matsumoto, this locus theory or Dhatuvada which he rejects as un-Buddhist is, it is the theory that the single eka, sama existent locus datu or basis is the cause that produces the manifold phenomena or super loci dharma. Matsumoto further argues that Tathagatagarbha thought was a Buddhist version of Hindu monism, formed by the influence of Hinduism gradually introduced into Buddhism, especially after the rise of Mahayana Buddhism. Other Japanese scholars responded to this view leading to a lively debate in Japan. Takasaki Jikido, a well-known authority on Tathagathagarbha thought, accepted that Buddha nature theories are similar to Upanishadic theories and that Dhatuvada is an accurate expression of the structure of these doctrines, but argues that the Buddha nature texts are aware of this and that Buddha nature is not necessarily un-Buddhist or anti-Buddhist. Likewise, Hirakawa Akira, sees Buddha nature as the potential to attain Buddhahood which not static but ever changing and argues that Datu does not necessarily mean substratum he points to some agamas which identify Datu with Pratitya Samyutpada, Western scholars have reacted in different ways to this idea. Sally B. King objects to their view, seeing the Buddha nature as a metaphor for the potential in all beings to attain Buddhahood, rather than as an ontological reality. Robert H. Scharf notes that the worries of the critical Buddhists is nothing new, for the early Tathagatagarbha scriptures betray a similar anxiety, as they tacitly acknowledge that the doctrine is close to, if not identical with, the heretical Atmavada teachings of the non-Buddhists. He also notes how the Nirvana Sutra tacitly concedes the non-Buddhist roots of the Tathagatagarbha idea. Scharf also has pointed out how certain Southern Chan masters were concerned with other interpretations of Buddha nature, showing how the tendency to critique certain views of Buddha nature is not new in East Asian Buddhism. Peter N. Gregory has also argued that at least some East Asian interpretations of Buddha nature are equivalent to what critical Buddhists call Dhatuvada, especially the work of Sung Mi, who emphasizes the underlying ontological ground on which all phenomenal appearances sang are based, which he variously refers to as the nature sing, the one mind I sheen. According to Dan Lusthaus, certain Chinese Buddhist ideologies which became dominant in the 8th century promoted the idea of an underlying metaphysical substratum, or underlying, invariant, universal metaphysical source, and thus do seem to be a kind of Dhatuvada. According to Lusthaus, in early Tang China 7th-8th century there was a deliberate attempt to divorce Chinese Buddhism from developments in India. Lusthaus notes that the Wyan thinker F. A. Sang was influential in this theological trend who promoted the idea that true Buddhism was about comprehending the one mind that alone is the ground of reality. Wei Xin, Paul Williams too has criticized this view, saying that critical Buddhism is too narrow in its definition of what constitutes Buddhism. According to Williams, we should abandon any simplistic identification of Buddhism with a straightforward not-self definition. Topic: <laughs> Multiple meanings. Sutton agrees with Williams' critique on the narrowness of any single interpretation. In discussing the inadequacy of modern scholarship on Buddha nature, Sutton states, 
one is impressed by the fact that these authors, as a rule, tend to opt for a single meaning disregarding all other possible meanings which are embraced in turn by other texts. He goes on to point out that the term Tathagatagarbha has up to six possible connotations. Of these, he says the three most important are an underlying ontological reality or essential nature tathagata tathata vutireka, which is functionally equivalent to a self atman in an Upanishadic sense. The dharmakaya which penetrates all beings sarva satvesu dharma kaya parasvarana, which is functionally equivalent to Brahman in an Upanishadic sense. The womb or matrix of Buddhahood existing in all beings Tathagata Gotra Sambhava, which provides beings with the possibility of awakening. Of these three, Sutton claims that only the third connotation has any soteriological significance, while the other two posit Buddha nature as an ontological reality and essential nature behind all phenomena. Topic. See also equals equals notes